Okay, welcome. I'm Danielle Uchatel, the Managing Director at Gallery Systems, and this presentation is the Online Scholarly Cataloging Initiative as manifest at the Seattle Art Museum, just up the street. Uh, if you haven't been to the museum yet during your stay here, you really, really should go. Um, as I found out the other day from Michelle, all you have to do is flash your MCN badge and you get in for free. So please take the opportunity to do that. It's a fantastic collection. Um, I'm going to start off with just a few minutes talking about the um, context of gallery systems, participation in the OSCE project, and then I'm going to turn it over to the people who actually did the work. And those people are immediately to my right, Polina Soshkina, who is the lead um, uh, web designer for the project. And next to her is Alex Hoffman, who is the lead developer. And then next to him is Michelle Miller, who is our liaison with um, the Seattle Art Museum and was a participant in this process from the beginning. So the, um, the Online Scholarly Cataloging Initiative, OSCE, is this Getty project to seed um, different approaches to um, creating publishing tools to create online scholarly catalogs in, um, in, the, art, in the fine arts predominantly. Um, and so that's kind of the broadest um, overview. You'll hear more about it from the other people on the panel. But we've been aware at Gallery Systems of this project for some time. And the reason we're aware of it is because we have a web publishing toolkit called eMuseum. And it works with lots of different systems, not only with Gallery Systems um, products. Um, and what we found over the years is that we had a lot of jobs where um, museums would contract us to create what we call the look and feel of their website. So they had data in a content ma a collection management system and they wanted to push it out to the web and so they would use eMuseum as a tool to do that. And we approached it as kind of a technical exercise where we would just sort of imitate their website, make it look integrated, and give them the, the out of the box functionality that eMuseum provided. What we were finding more and more is that museums, as they became more sophisticated with their use of the web and the things that were possible, they would hire their own web design firms who would then plan a design for their website. They might still want to use eMuseum to push their data out to the web. So the designers and the web teams would come to gallery systems and ask us lots of questions about how to use the tools. We would answer those questions and they would end up with a really great site. But the problem is the, the web teams were getting the money and we were being asked the questions. So it occurred to us that maybe we should have our own web team in-house. So we started um, kind of a wholly owned subsidiary that we call Web Atelier. I even have a business card that says Web Atelier and has a nice little picture on it. Um, there's, none of us remembered to bring our Web Atelier business card, so I can't uh, hold one up and show it to you. But the purpose of Web Atelier was to bid on these kinds of jobs that before we were just being handmade into, and we really wanted to insert ourselves into the process because we thought we could bring something to the table in the right circumstances. And the very first job that we bid on was um, the Seattle OSCE project. We learned about it. We asked for the uh, RFP. We answered the RFP. It was the first one that we had ever done um, for this kind of a project. And you know we put our heart and soul into it. And we won it. We were really happy. So then we went and built it. And you'll hear about the building. Um, just a little bit about working with Seattle. The, um, the principal, um, the, pro what I, who, the person I would call the project principal on the Seattle side was uh, Dr. Mimi Gates. She is the director emerita of the Seattle Art Museum. So she is extremely knowledgeable about museum practice. So she had the whole sort of museum side of it completely covered. Also because this project focuses on Chinese scrolls and calligraphy, uh, Mimi Gates is also um, uh, a scholar of Chinese art. And she's done that for decades and decades. And she's a world-renowned expert who has published and taught and researched in this area. So she also had very clear ideas of what she wanted to have appear in this um, online scholarly catalog based on her knowledge of the content. And Mimi Gates, um, her family makes software. You may have heard of her son. 
And so she is extremely technologically sophisticated and very, very demanding, but in a good way. She isn't used to hearing no, um, but that has spurred us to, um, to sort of um, uh, reach heights that we might not have if the client had been more um, uh, laissez-faire about it. It's, it's always tempting to take an easy approach when you're dealing with a client, and at first you think you want a client that's easy to deal with, but sometimes the demanding clients are the best because they make you stretch, and uh, she's made a stretch, and she's been really phenomenal to work with. Um, what else did I want to say about it? I guess that's all I'll say about, about um, the crew, and then I'm just going to turn it over to Polina, who will talk you through the design elements, and then Alex, who will talk about the technical side, and then Michelle, who will talk about the um, Seattle side. I think Michelle's going to go first. Oh, all right, they've changed already. Okay, <laughs> Michelle's going to go first. Hi, everybody. I'm really delighted to be here, and I have to tell you, this OSCE project has been just a dream for me. Um, the reason I was involved with it was um, I was the uh, database administrator for the Seattle Art Museum, taking care of all the objects and using TMS as that. Um, and I do have a background in graphic arts, and I have a long career in museums as well as collections manager. In fact, I was collections manager at Experience Music Project before I came to SAM. So I've handled a number of different types of material culture in my career. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about our team. And Josh Yu, Dr. Josh Yu, who is here with us, um, is the Chinese curator at Seattle Art Museum. And um, he really has been the heart and soul behind this and the brains in terms of pulling together the content, pulling together the research, working with the scholars who wrote essays, and um, bringing it all along, bringing it all together. Uh, the other people that have been on this team are Carol Mabbitt, who's in our development office, um, and C Christina DePaulo started the project with us before she left to go to uh, San Diego. So we were lucky enough to have Christina in the very beginning, and then we had a little bit of a dry spell, and then we have a wonderful woman named Debbie Finn who came on with um, some technical expertise. Um, but Sam, just so you know, we have eight curators. We have an encyclopedic uh, collection. We have 25,000 objects in the collection. And we have one uh, web designer, one uh, web engineer. So. We were really looking for something that we could sustain into the future and use tools that we were familiar with. And uh, those were our challenges. Uh, so gallery systems, when they came along and answered the RFP and uh, talked to us about using eMuseum and the tools that we were already familiar with, we thought, you know, this is really a win-win situation. Um, Another thing I'd like to say is that uh, we, we started from scratch, really, building content. Uh, we also re-photographed the entire group of objects. And we have now it's 126 objects, I think is the total number, that are going to appear in the catalog. So if you can imagine uh, a 30-foot scroll, for example, and having an individual image taken of each section of that scroll and then have to be stitched together. Because of the type of material we are working with, there are some uh, added challenges and added concerns. So it's been good for us, I think, as a group, and I think Josh would agree with me. Um, you can talk to him later. I'm putting him on the spot. But um, I, I think that it's been a great partnership with Gallery Systems, and I just want to say that. Uh, we had to hire a contract photographer as a result as well because we don't have a full-time photographer in-house. That position was cut. So just to talk about the limitations, talk about the challenges, and talk about this exciting program that I hope you'll enjoy seeing. And if you have questions, I'll be here after this. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Polina. And, um, this had been a really challenging project. Okay, <laughs> yeah, and I'm really soft-spoken, so I have to try to. She is a very, very soft talker. This mic is only for the Yes, yes. Sorry. So, let me just give you this jet plane that's behind us here, because that would really help. There's an off button. 
So I will give you a quick overview of design challenges that we faced. Um, while creating this user experience, we had to address what it means to take a physical catalog and translate it into web experience. And uh, there's certain, there are obvious advantages to having a web version of a catalog. It could be easily updated, and you could use social uh, interaction to generate new content. And at the same time, you could leverage technology. Oh, this is wonderful. <laughs> There you go. Thank you. <laughs> you, could, you could leverage technology to create teaching and research tools. And these are some of the things that we did. On this slide, you could see just a quick overview of some objects from the collection. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start talking about um, the first steps of our project. So in the beginning, we dealt with planning and requirements. And this is, it's never as straightforward as it seems. And we used wireframing as one of the tools to gather requirements. So as you could see here, this is just a high fidelity wireframe. And having a detailed wireframe makes it easier to communicate, made it easier for us to communicate with the team at Seattle Art Museum. And we were able to go back and forth and really take out unnecessary functionality and focus just on the key features. And this is, this is an example of explore view, uh, an example of an item view, and also an example of inscriptions and seals. And you will see a lot more of this uh, in the final product. So while we're doing wireframing, uh, we came up with our approach to information architecture. At the Seattle Art Museum, they were in the process of creating really high resolution images. And we decided to take this chance to create an image centric design. And it was very important for us to flatten our information architecture. And let me show you exactly what I mean on the website. So here we have an item page. And we wanted the user to never lose the context of the object. So majority of the space is taken up by this image. And you could see we could zoom in and see it in real details. And you could see where we are in the image as well. And then we have really basic information on the side, which, could, which we could hide. So this is the first level. And then the rest of information, like quick facts about the artists, inscriptions and seals, essays, bibliography, is available just one click away. That's the second level. And the third level is in-depth in essay is a good example of that. But as you could see, it's all like one page application at this point, and you never lose the context of the actual artwork. So let's move to. One thing you should also notice is that was the site. That's, the, that's a real site. That's not a mock up. That's not a wireframe. That's a truly interactive site. It's not mm -hmm. live yet. I know that's your next question, mm -hmm. but that is the site. So now we'll tackle a couple of design decisions. Let's go forward and we'll navigate back to the Explore view. I'm kind of starting from, 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 from the image, but here's the home page. And in order to view the collection, we just click Explore the collection. And we, just, we were faced with dilemmas. Should we use search ver, using Search versus Explore? Because even though the site is meant for scholars, we cannot expect users to know a lot about the collection. So we decided to go with the Explore approach, because when you have a physical catalog, you could just flip through the pages and you get an idea what kind of content is available. So to replicate this experience on the web, we expose the entire collection in the Explore page, and we have infinite scrolling here, so which works pretty well, considering the collection is quite small as well. So we took advantage of it. We have filters on the left-hand side, which give you an idea about structure of the data and allow you to filter and uh, allow you to narrow your search results as well. And another set of design decisions actually dealt with different formats. I was fortunate enough to visit the Seattle Art Museum and take a look at the real objects, and it's a really unique collection. We have. They have scrolls, as Michelle mentioned, that are sometimes are over 30 feet wide. And these hand scrolls, and let me show you, I actually have a picture of that. The, these hand scrolls are usually viewed um, section by section. 
So th this is a good example. As you could see, um, there is a hand scroll and you could see only one part of it, but we also have hanging scrolls, which you could view entirely from afar. And the way we decided to deal with this is by having zooming functionality, which gives you a new experience as opposed to what you see in the gallery. So let's say, let's actually filter, filter by scrolls. Format hand scroll. And we were able to see all the hand scrolls in this subset of the collection. By the way, this is not the full collection, it's just what we currently have published. There are gonna be more artworks. And this is actually quite a beautiful scroll. And as, as you could see, you could pan around and view it section by section as you would if you actually were able to hold it in your hands. But at the same time, you could get the full overview by zooming out. Another, actually the most challenging format was albums. And um, we had to present albums in such a way that you, you can see all the leaves, but also you get the context of the album. And we did it by, um, by having a thumbnail strip. So let me take away this filter and we'll just view the albums. So let's say here's looping, looping album, which I actually also had a chance to see in real life. It's a quite a small book. And here you could zoom in beyond the actual size of the leaves. So as you could see here, we have like a little carousel and you could flip through all the pages. But uh, another um, unique aspect of albums is that they could be mounted quite differently. You could have a butterfly kind of mounting or you could have a thatched window mounting or accordion. So butterfly and accordion, they open sideways like this album here. While the thatched window mounting, you open like one leaf um, on top of another. I'll show you an example of that. So we were faced with a challenge, how do we hint uh, on the change of album orientation in the catalog? So let's go back and Xiaomi is a great example of that. Th this, this album is actually not, not intact. It's a collection of different leaves, but you could see the carousel here is faced um, vertically. So we get an idea that leaves open one on top of another. But I would say in, in a way, these are the easy aspects of album. The most challenging one for us is how albums are conceptualized and documented. Because sometimes you're lucky enough and you get an intact album with its original binding and you can accession this one object. But sometimes you get leaves from all, all over the place and they're matted separately and um, Again, you accession them as separate objects, and you could see how that could introduce discrepancy. But another aspect of it, how do you represent <coughs> albums in search results? We conducted some usability testing and found out that um, people preferred to see all the album leaves exposed because this way it gives them the quick overview of everything available and they could really utilize filters. Because for example, if you're interested in certain subject matter, you, sometimes album, could, album leaves could have different subject matter. So this way, if you filter and explore view, it's possible to get relevant results. The same goes sometimes for artists, even though usually there's just one artist, but there are cases when album leaves have different artists. However, that's, that presents another set of problems because albums are considered as a single work of art. So here we have, in a way, usability and findability and the web versus scholarly research and scholarly accur accuracy, which is something that's still an open-ended question for us. And we came up with a couple of design solutions of how this could be resolved, and I can actually show you one proposed solution, which we might go with, but we, we actually don't, do not know yet. So let's, let's take a look at this. It's possible to maybe show it as one album record, but give an ability to flip through different leaves 
And if you're going to be adding to your personal favorites, to have an ability to choose which leaf you're adding. But this is basically just one of the options. But for now, we just dealt with how to display this collection online. But the main uh, purpose of the project was to create teaching and research tools. And as you, could see, as you will be able to see, a lot of the collection deals with calligraphy. And being able to view uh, inscriptions, colophons, and seals, and their translations and transcriptions is a really important part of the project. But it was difficult in terms of being able to fit all this information in limited space at the same time without cluttering the interface. So let's take it uh, when Zamming scroll, for example. Once we open inscriptions and seals, we could see that we could match different pieces of information. So we could still explore the entire scroll. But at the same time, we could click on the area and we could and this will bring up a transcription and translation in English. And also we could vice versa, click on the text and bring up this information. We have tabs here if you want to view just inscriptions, just, colof just colophons or just seals. So when we came up with this way of viewing inscriptions, colophons, and seals, that pretty much dictated what kind of tool we had to create to enter this information. So let me log in. It's part of eMuseum dashboard, and I will demonstrate to you how this inf in information is entered by scholars at Seattle Art Museum. And we're going to go to the dashboard. Um, this, this section is not entirely finished yet, so it's not going to look that pretty. So look. And let me. Let me go down again to one jamming scroll which is pretty much annotated, so I have to find a small area here where I can actually input new annotations. So what was challenging about this is that sentences do not necessarily end like at the bottom at the bottom of the scroll. So we couldn't just have like you know draw boxes. We actually needed to have a polygon tool for more accuracy. So let's find an area. I think there were a couple of seals. And Josh, please forgive me. The information I'm going to be entering here will not match the seal. <laughs> I actually took it from somewhere else. But what I can do in here, I have this Word document open, and I can actually paste right from the document. So I already have some information. Like, for example, let's copy this Chinese text. And if I'll go back, I can take this tool, draw the shape. And right away, I can enter Chinese. And then I'll be able to enter English. But also an important part of this is being able to organize it in groups. So once I enter English, Let's say this is part of artist seals because we want to group all the artist seals together. And I can see we have a bunch of groups created, but none of them artist seals. So I'm going to create a new label. And I'll call it artist seals. And for now, I will choose not to enter any other information. It's not necessary, but I will indicate the type is seal. And I will create this group. So now we can see that it's artist seals. And if I'll save it, you'll be able to see that this will appear here all the way at the end. Here's our entry. And if I'm gonna if I'm gonna annotate another seal, it's gonna be part of that group if I'll add it to this label. 
This, is, this was a way to organize all of this information. And, and, and each one of the annotations gets a unique ID. And I can show you where it's used. So if I'll go back to the main site. As you could see here on the home page, we're able to pull out seals. And if I'll click on the seal, it actually will go directly to the seal. So we're using those unique IDs in TMS to be able to point to those specific areas. Um, besides having an ability to really study in depth inscriptions, colophons, and seals, we also wanted to um, challenge scholars to to interact with the site and to post their own opinions as well, which is why we have a couple of commenting options. Here in the comment tab, and you could see a couple of comments already, you could leave a comment, but also you could um, create a region tag. So here's one of the region tags for this comment. And uh, when you, you could you could be also become a scholar on the site, which basically a special role and gives your comments more weight. So the comments that you see on the home page basically come from scholars. Their comments are weighted more than general users' comments. But that's just one level on which you could comment. We also have in-depth essays, and this feature has commenting as well. And besides, we also have here comparative images. And these images are not from Sam's collection, they're from other institutions. And, uh, but this way you could still read the essay and view the images at the same time. Mention the footnotes. Yeah, and the footnotes, yeah. And another thing, we also have citations which are pretty much dynamic, and we could go from one citation, citation to another here as well. And if you're a scholar, now let me show you this profile panel. When you're a scholar, you get a scholarly badge. <laughs> <laughs> and if you leave a comment, you'll actually get like a little badge right next to your comment, so people will know that you're a scholar. <laughs> And there's this whole approval process, which is pretty simple. All you do, you enter your um, title and your institution's name, and it's optional if you would like to enter a short biographical information. And on the dashboard, um, any, anyone who's an administrator on the side could see new scholar requests, could review them and approve, and you instantly become a scholar on the side at that point. Another way to interact, we have uh, something that I refer to almost as scholarly jeopardy, because um, scholars at Seattle Art Museum are able to come up with questions related to objects in the collection. And both general users and scholars could answer these questions, and then administrator of the site has an option to mark the best answer. So this is another way to encourage conversation. And a, a lot of the things that we did, on the, a, a lot of the ways we fine-tuned the website uh, were affected by results of our usability testing. And um, we, we actually did two rounds of testing. One of them was during uh, the prototyping phase, and another round of test testing during development phase. And um, Michelle and Josh, uh, recommended scholars as test subjects for us. And we were able to perform a lot of the tests online and even some of them in person. And basically usability testing is a one-on-one -on -one kind of process. And what's great about it is that you could actually get real data in terms of it's not about opinion, I like something, or I like this color, or this design. You basically observe them using the site, you give them the specific tasks, and you could see how successful they can complete them. So I will show you a couple of things that we improved as a result of usability testing. For example, inscriptions and seals. 
we realized that people were not accustomed to just um, pressing on the border of the on the border of annotation. So we made inside of annotations clickable. And also, as you could see here, we had like really plain text. So only on hover you could see that it's clickable. So we had to make the entire thing a lot more obvious by creating those little modules. So you could see that the text is clickable as well as the annotation. And also have a little bit more contrast to show which area is selected. Another obvious one, which wasn't a big change, is that in my collections, in order, um, in, in order to add a collection or to delete a collection or edit a collection, we had, we had this whole um, panel at the bottom. But then we realized that nobody could find it because uh, a lot of status information would cover it. And also, it's part of the toolbar. And let, let me just demonstrate where that is on the side. So here I am in my collections. And by the way, as a new user, I get my own un untitled collection by default. And then I create, can create as many collections as I would like to. So let me add an object. And as you could see, it gets added instantly. And I can add a note. And when I collapse, I actually will save it as well. Now I can create another collection. Let's see. Favorite scrolls. And some kind of information here. It's not, it's not necessary, but I just want to show you how, that the node would show up. And what I can do, I can drag objects from one collection to another. So I can uh, collect it in one place and then organize it. This was also envisioned as a teaching tool as well, because you could share this collection and make it public so the students in the class could see just certain set of objects and your nodes, and maybe you could use the node field for assignment as well. And sometimes even the simplest things work because copy is also important. So this change probably took like, you know, like, like a minute, but it makes a difference. For example, saying start is very ambiguous and people don't really read the text that comes before it. They really expect to see the action and the button. So making it explore the collection made it much more obvious. So sometimes there, what you can fix during usability testing doesn't have to be big things. But those small changes, they do make a difference. It's one of the things I, would, I wanted to point out. And now I'm ready to pass it on to Alex. Before you do, are there I think we'll stop here for questions and then continue. Are there any questions for Polina? I'm curious whether the content that you're adding through the tool um, automatically goes back into TMS so that it's preserved somewhere else. That's it. It's actually right now preserved in eMuseum database. There is no synchronization between TMS and eMuseum for that particular content. If you want, I can I can go into right. my part and because it's probably going to answer part some part of the questions yeah. that you already have. My name's Alex Hoffman, and I'm going to talk about some of the technical challenges that we had building the Seattle Art Museum Online Scholarly Catalog. Uh, because after the wireframe and the design phases were complete, we were tasked with uh, the decisions, what types of technology should we use for all the different functionalities that were, uh, type, types of technology that were used for uh, the functionality on the website, such as the zooming tool and my collections and the, the essay. Um, and we already knew, uh, because the SAM team has chosen to use TMS and eMuseum as the main applications driving the website, that, that that's what we were going to be dealing with. Uh, and it made perfect sense, because they already have TMS and eMuseum uh, with limited resources, and they already know how to use both of these applications, so it fit pretty perfectly for them. So I'm going to go into uh, both of TMS and eMuseum a little bit. Uh, they not just uh, leverage the basic label copy data from TMS, 
but they were able to leverage the thesaurus attributes. Uh, so things like album or scroll or fan painting, uh, these are controlled attributes that they can attach to each one of these objects, define whether it's a horizontal scroll or a uh, vertical scroll, a horizontal album or a vertical album so that we can determine all of this on the front end, whether we have to put things like the carousel that you saw for the album leaves on the bottom of the page or on the side of the page. We also used some of the new features in TMS 2012 like media packages to control the featured uh, seal on the home page as well as the home page slider. Media packages are just a way of bundling media within TMS. And the great thing about it is that you can always switch out the media within TMS and keep it fresh on the site, fresh and dynamic, so that nothing ever gets too stale. We also used uh, the good old object packages uh, to keep track of things like the, uh, the latest comments, uh, or even the, the entire OSCE collection, because uh, one of the features, as Polina has shown you, is to explore the entire collection, the, the big red button on the home page. It is one big object package. Um, and what Polina also alluded to, and uh, what your question was about um, containing the, all of the data in one spot. Um, when we, when we import into eMuseum, we only uh, pull specific information um, because eMuseum is a, uh, it's just a snapshot of the collection database. So on that import, we can modify the data. We can actually create some of these object packages on the fly, uh, such as the entire collection, uh, create some of the relationships, so this helps to alleviate some of the uh, data entry in TMS and the overhead work. Uh, just a little technical background on, on eMuseum, our web publishing tool. Uh, it's an XHTML, uh, Java, sorry, a Java-based Java XHTML framework. And it is specifically tailored to pull data from TMS, but it can data from any collection management system or really any data store that you have your collection data in. And now some of the more advanced customizations. Do you want to try? I can, I can. Yeah. Okay. So there's a big difference between default eMuseum, uh, slightly customized eMuseum, and then eMuseum on steroids, which is what this <laughs> OSCE project is. Uh, and some of the major customizations are the zooming feature. And we went through a whole bunch of different options for the zooming feature to see which technology would fit best for it. Uh, one of them is Zoomify. And most of you have probably heard about Zoomify. And eMuseum actually uses it by default. It comes out of the box with, with eMuseum. It's a pretty smooth uh, zooming tool. And it actually has a lot of the different customizations that we would need to make to it already out of the box. And it is a commercial product. So there's support for us if, if we chose to use that but it's Flash-based. And at the time of our decision, they didn't have an HTML5 JavaScript version. Uh, this was a couple years ago. Uh, they were, they're just in development, very light API, very uh, little uh, documentation. And so we decided that we would, we would look at other options. Another option that we looked at was the Google Maps API for zooming. But that had a bunch of drawbacks also, including we would have to put Google's logo on it. It wasn't actually specific for, uh, for object data. Um, and they had a, a pretty, uh, they didn't have any of the features that we would need, such as the navigator or annotations or anything like that. And then we, we looked at open layers. We looked at lip imaging. We looked at Silverlight. 
Um, but all of them had their own drawbacks, and we finally decided to use the Sea Dragon Ajax viewer. Uh, the Sea Dragon Ajax viewer is a purely JavaScript application, and it's very extendable. It had a very robust API, a lot of documentation, and uh, very easy to extend for what we needed to use it for. And JavaScript is one of the languages of the future. It's uh, compatible with all platforms, Mac, Windows, and mobile devices. And so we thought for longevity, this would be the best solution. Um, so you can see it's also pretty smooth. <coughs> and so that's why we chose it. Uh, getting into some of the details of the images, uh, like Polina and Michelle said, some of these images were very large, uh, sorry, the objects were very large um, and had to be photographed up to 30 feet long. So between 10 and 15 photographs for each one of these large objects, very high resolution photos, and then stitched together. And Margaret Lee on our design team stitched them together in Photoshop. And then we ran them through a deep zoom composer tool to tile them. If you go back to the, the slide, we, we ran them through this program to tile them into smaller images so that you can, we have all these little bits of the, the larger portion and you can zoom into each one or, or drag around. And then uh, we went even further and contacted the, the developers of the CJAG and Ajax viewer and got some of the older DLL files, some of the, the development files, so that we can create a batch process. So we didn't actually have to process one image at a time through the, through the Deep Zoom Composer. We can just run it and it'll tile them for us. And we had ran into a whole bunch of other uh, challenges with keeping all the photographs together uh, and uh, before and after the stitching and, and the album leaves. Um, and keeping it all bundled together. Some of the features that didn't come with the Sea Dragon Ajax viewer are features like the navigator that's being dragged around right now. The navigator is actually another viewer on top of the main viewer. And you can see uh, it, keep track, it keeps track of your zoom level. And it also keeps track of your position on the main viewer. And integrating that with the main viewer was a big undertaking in a, in a math sense. Um, another couple of features was the, the left uh, plus and minus over here to just zoom in like this. And the inscriptions and seals here to be able to actually draw on top of an image uh, and keep track of these markings on the image at any zoom level. Do it, to do this, we used SVG graphics. Okay. So I guess some questions that come up are uh, how far should you or, or can you take your e-museum customization? And uh, that really gets back to what I was talking about earlier, about this is e-museum on steroids, and it's actually becoming more of the norm. Um, some features in this, like the filtering, for example, are becoming expected by users, by users and by uh, institutions all around the world. They want to be able to filter their search results. Um, and if, if you don't see it, then it, it's, it actually raises some questions. But to have it, um, it's really great in conjunction with some other features on the site, such as the My Collections feature. So you can do a search, or you can actually view the entire collection and then refine the search, or the, the results set down from that, and then create a My Collection off of that refined set. 
the infinite scrolling on the on the explore page if you view the entire collection mm -hmm. and, and collapse this you could see that if you continue to scroll down the explore page is going to continue to load objects onto the page the scroll bar on the side gets bigger you don't actually have to page from one page to the other and have to view 10 objects at a time and this is this is a feature that we've seen on a few other sites and uh, we all really liked it Sam really liked it, and we decided to integrate it into this. We thought it was a very usable, user-friendly feature. Uh, the eMuseum dashboard, which allows you to manage the comments and the, the annotations editor, the questions and answers, and the registered users, uh, is also very essential to a site like this that's going to hopefully have uh, a lot of traffic, be able to monitor, manage, and uh, uh, all the, the users and the comments uh, edit, delete, and, and make annotations on, on the individual artworks. And then finally, the, the share buttons, the share and the like buttons for social media. You could see on the left-hand side here, they're becoming, uh, again, if you don't see the share buttons, then you wonder uh, what this, how old the site is maybe. Um, because they're, they're so prominent on the web now and expected. And uh, it's a great tool to have to be able to share either the, the entire site, an individual object, or maybe even share a My Collection uh, with, with your peers or with your students or colleagues. So, um, so that's another feature that we've included on, on this website. And I guess there's one more thing that I forgot to mention in terms of testing. We also did like an A-B split testing of the home page to determine which approach uh, would be favorable. And let me show you um, some of the images for that. So basically we created one home page where we have like more information, we're pulling some of the features of the website and exposing them. And another version where image really takes the main uh, stage. But what we found out that general users were really compelled by a really large image, while scholars, and that's our main audience, like to see a little bit more information. But there was consensus among both groups. But when you have something that, um, where you're focusing primarily on the image, people think that this is just an exhibition website. While if you expose some of the content on the website, it becomes obvious that the website is being updated and it's its own entity. So it becomes more of a tool rather than just the record of the exhibition. And as we'll be able to see on the home page here, we're bringing out just the key features, basically the featured essay, featured seals, latest comments, which shows that people are participating on the site. And also another thing that we're creating is the screencast of what kind of features are available and how to use the site. Because a lot of the users of this site potentially will be not web savvy users. And I think this is a basic overview of what we did so far. And it would be great to hear some feedback. I have a question. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the decision to really focus on the images here versus like the Art Institute's um, decision for the same, for, the, for their OSCE project to really um, think of it as an essay, like a, as a collected essay, and their focus was not on that. I'm wondering if you can say yeah. more about the decision, both from the museum perspective and from, and from the I'm told I'm supposed to repeat the question for the recording, so even though we all heard you very clearly, I'm going to repeat the question, which is, um, why did you decide to focus on the images rather than um, some other aspects, such as the scholarship? Well, the main reason is the calligraphy, because we needed a way to, the key feature of the website is studying the calligraphy, being able to see inscriptions, colophons, and seals, and Calligraphy, it's a very specific form of art. It's very, it's very important to be able to see what kind of brushwork they're using in order to study it. 
which is why we create an image centric design. Another reason is because we did have high res because Scott, because they were producing really high resolution images at Seattle Art Museum, and we wanted to take advantage of that. Bec a, lo a lot of times when you're um, attending like an exhibit, you don't have even an option to view things in such great detail. So inscriptions and seals was definitely the main reason for this approach. Can you show us that, um, a little more about how the reading experience would work? We saw the little hints of it, but that might answer. Right? Oh, sure. Right. I think that would be a great idea. Plain, if you can take us to one of the essays. Um, we kind of skimmed over the essays, and I think that some of the essays are 30 pages long, um, so there is quite an in-depth uh, prose uh, feature as well as the images. Um, if we can... I think one other point to make is that uh, we wanted to make the site very interactive, just draw the user mm -hmm. in, so that was another reason for right. having the, the, the image, image viewer right. so prominent. But, uh, but I know what you mean. I've seen the Chicago um, site, and I, I know exactly what you mean. Um, something else that Mimi was really interested in, and she kept saying, you know, this is really not a book. You know, we don't want to turn it into a book. We want to use tools that are available on a website as opposed to just trying to reproduce a book online. So there is a lot of content here, and, and Polina is scrolling through now. Um, the other thing we needed to do was to have the ability to add Unicode. Uh, we did want to be able to add Chinese characters. Um, this is something else that we were able to do with, um, you know, having TMS and, and, and behind it. So, but if you look at the, um, more about the essay, Polina, instead of the comments, yeah. So it is, I think it's very readable. Something else that Mimi asked for and, and we included um, was the fact that you can change the size of the font. Um, Polina can maybe demonstrate that. Uh, well, it's not totally working yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry but, about that. But basically, the standard font size that we're using is 17 pixels, which is really large enough for majority of people, but you could go even larger once we'll implement this feature. Right. And the text size changes yes. right here. Can you print the essay if you wanted to have a copy to take with you? Yes. Yes. That's a really good question. And um, I'll go ahead and s say from my perspective on that. Um, when we met, when we started working on this project a, a few years ago, you know, we, we had to really get a list of our desires and hopes and dreams. And being able to read it on a Kindle or an iPhone was not something that we um, asked for from our designers. So in that, in that sense, that's what I would say. Yes. I think Josh, you should answer that. He's right here. Yeah, um, that's a really good question. There are two ways that we're going about this. One is um, you notice that on the essay, uh, there are two ways that the scholars can add comments. One is that they can add comments to the work of art. Some people may say that, oh, this work of art really compares well with another one in such and such museums. In that case, they can just add a comment to the comment section. Or some people may have a very specific comment uh, related to the essay, in which case they would just add their comments following the essay. And so there are multiple threads that we would encourage. But how would you encourage them to use it? How, how would we that? encourage them to use it? Um, well, that actually gets, gets into Marketing of, yeah. of the launch of the site, which I don't think we have really come to uh, a great conclusion on how we would launch the sites yet. Mm -hmm. But one way that I am envisioning this is that uh, we have very close relations <coughs> with uh, university professors, and so um, we are going to do some of the uh, mailing list with uh, Asian art historians and then encourage them to use the site. Um, one way, for well, one specific feature that we added to the catalog is that we have raised several questions um, regarding the essays as well as the work of art. And um, 
And so the way that we think about it is that when a teacher is a professor is teaching a course on Chinese painting, for instance, so one of these essays could be their required readings. And in fact, the way that we conceive of the catalog is that it's not so much my own writing, but you know, we have members of 12 scholars of um, you know, of really great stature in the field to get their input to contribute uh, on the essays. So some people may be more interested in their writings than on our objects. So we, in a sense, using their, you know, using their stature to kind of promote our collection, so to speak. And then, um, and then another aspect is that we would raise questions. I, in particular, me and I have been you know, reading some of these essays. And sometimes we disagree with some of these scholars, even though as editors we could edit out the, you know, the parts that we disagree with. But in a sense, we kind of twist that a little bit and just on the essay's questions, we would say, well, you know, this argument hinges upon that assumption. But if we were to look at it from another way, uh, is there a case to be made about this? So we kind of encourage uh, discussion on that front and then see what, and if people were to answer to that, then we will get the dialogue going. Um, so that's another strategy that we have used. And the third way that we have done it is, um, the kernel is actually divided into uh, four parts right now. It's divided into four groups. And the first group, it's really, you know, museum speak, we, the kind of works that we consider to be the cream of the crop of the collection. So there are eight of such works, and then all of those works are uh, really in that essay, uh, you know, 5,000 or so, even longer. So that's group one. And then the second group are the genuine works, but then that have uh, shorter entries. So that about you know, 1,000 words. And then we have the third group. The third group are uh, works that are you know, perfectly fine. And many of them are new acquisitions, but which we do not have a scholarly entry. So those are the groups that we would open up for contributions. And depending on the quality of the submissions that we get from scholars, um, if it is a, you know, a really good essay on a work of art, then we would bump up that work on group three group one. Or if it's just a, you know, it could be a mediocre work and then the quality of the entry may also be quite brief, it's a thousand words, then would we'll be moved to group two. Um, and then the final group, group four, uh, the, you know, kind of problematic works that are either not genuine or there are some questions about it. Or, you know, what we joke about, you know, not be certain on the essay. So in that case, we just have to be <laughs> But these are the three main ways that we want to engage um, yeah. the scholars. Do you um, expect that this will persist to the, degree, to the degree where other scholars could cite this and um, be sure that it, it will still be there? Or does it exist in the form? Uh, I'm not sure if I understand your question. What if someone wanted to cite some? some oh, sure. Yeah. That, that's, that's yeah, we expect this to yeah, be up. You know, our, our intention is this will become. Um, the first of many uh, SAM interactives and in that we will be publishing more catalogs and, and we would hope that scholars would cite the information that they're finding on our site, absolutely. Well, well, what is your question about, well, we have, we, the, the integrity of the essays would remain. I mean, we are not going to change the essays. Right. Is that your concern? Well, I mean, it's just That's weird they actually true. exist over time. Well, they have right. existed somewhere else. Mm -hmm. We yes. expect to yeah. live on the, yeah, we expect right. to live on the website. Let's try another question. Let's see. We had somebody back here. Well, it's, it's, it's somewhat related, but, but uh, also speaking to the comment that Alex made earlier. Um, I guess I'm wondering, given the obvious sophistication of the application and the amount of effort that goes into a, up front and versus the kind of constant changing technology landscape, how do you future-proof yourself against you know the every five-year cycle of everything breaking? You know, Alex, you touched on Flash. And not an option, you know, six years ago, it would have been the way we would have done it. Right. right. Well, so, how, you know, given the limited funding and resources, how do you, how do you plan for that? Are we, are we supposed to repeat the question first? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sustainability, yeah. Sustainability for a website. Uh, uh, just one thing that I would like to say is you're right. I mean, technology is changing all the time. And let's say in five years from now, I mean, you know, who's to say? Um, I think the fact that we archive all of the information, um, the way the essays are entered, they become a media record as a PDF. So with HTML, 
they've gone through Dreamweaver. So I think that those, all of those assets will be archived. Yeah, I'm, I'm, right. I guess I'm not thinking so much about the content because right. clearly it's, it's about the book. You're, you're talking more about the application. Experience. That's yeah, Alex. Right. Alex will tell you. Scholars are citing a resource. Well, we just tried to do as much research as possible before we actually chose any of these uh, technology decisions. Um, and you're right, the web does have this five year life cycle. Um, you just have to try and prepare for that. And uh, well, the most important, happens. yeah, the most Here's, important thing is. Funding? Do you put money into escrow so that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, you have some of that money? Yes, no. we'll, we'll, uh, take, I we'll, we'll take some right now. No, no I, I think we just have to hope that uh, we made, yeah. made the right decisions. It'll last as long mm -hmm. as possible. The most important thing is the content. So we have it all mm -hmm. documented already. And uh, if things need to be updated, then, then we make those updates. Yeah, and I just want to say my experience here is that um, the content and the development of the content has been such a huge pro part of this project. You know, the technology, the bells and whistles, we all get really interested. We have some of the images are two and three uh, gigabytes, so they're huge files. But, you know, that's one thing. Content development is really key, and Josh has been, you know, painstakingly working on that, and I do what I can, but, you know, maybe Josh wants to say something about content. Well, I, I just wanted to respond to that point. Um, the, we are aware of the, of the life cycle of the web, of course, but I think which is one reason why we made a very conscious decision to keep the website as clean and as simple as possible, because you don't really see a bunch of really fancy but you know, it's just really. I don't know, Alex. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, no, 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 that is part, well, from, from my perspective, from Sam's perspective, that is part of the plan. We went into this, you know, um, we made a conscious decision to go with Chinese painting and calligraphy. It had never been published before, some of our works. We had a new scholarship um, bringing Josh on. Um, and, and, and Mimi, being the kind of the driver or the, or the project supervisor, had a passion for, uh, for the content. So, um, it's almost like we took the most difficult pieces. You know, we have very few other paintings that are 30 feet long. Um, I'll tell you, we have none. So, um, so I think if we start there and then work our way towards ceramics, we have a wonderful catalog that's already been published, for example, called Porcelain Stories. And my hope would be that that maybe could be a new catalog. We just published a catalog on uh, a collection of Australian Aboriginal paintings that's lovely. And all of that was photographed. So, you know, we're realizing we learned so much from this process in terms of content development and in terms of, you know, what you really need to capture as assets to be able to then replicate it. Um, so my hope is, yes, this is the first of many. But we'll see what they say. In terms of a, a clear-cut template for OSCE projects, this is actually pretty customized towards the, the Chinese painting and calligraphy, but um, it, it could become a template for these types of projects. Any question? Since we're talking about the difficulty of capturing the work, can you tell us a little bit about how you photograph the works and the resolution standards? Um, I, can, I can talk a little bit about that. I'm in the registrar's office, and now I'm the registrar for the permanent collection. So. You know, you also have to understand we have three sites, and most of our Asian work is stored at Volunteer Park, which is a couple miles away from where our photography studio is. So there was a lot of art handling involved, a lot of registration work involved. You know, we have a big team of people in the background who pull this all in. Um, our contract photographer actually was trained by Stanley Smith, who's at the Getty. Um, they worked together when I worked at Experience Music Project. So we were lucky enough that we could, you know, kind of call Stanley and say, what do you think? Um, so that was really helpful. Um, Susan Cole also had been a photographer with us, so some of the images were taken by her, and she was previously at Yale. So we have, you know, in terms of the size of the images, some of them 
our two and three gigabytes. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about ratios, that would be Paulina and Alex. Well, um, some of the scrolls are actually up to four gigabytes. And uh, originally, they're raw files, then we convert them to TIFFs. But uh, all we actually have f scrolls were photographed in sections. And there are certain discrepancies when you do that, which is the reason why we, have to, we had to manually stitch them together and in Photoshop and basically to make sure that all the transitions are correct and we color corrected them. And it was quite a piece of work in that regard. <laughs> and the resolution? And um, well, the original files, well, actually, we, we did not have the consistent, uh, some, some files are larger than others. Um, but all of them are at least like 600 dpi, but a lot of them are more than that. Um, as a scholar, I'm interested um, about uh, one of the important features, I think, that web-based publishing, at least theoretically, makes possible, and that is flexibility. And so I'm curious to know what, the, what procedures might be in place for adding new essays. What if one wants to introduce comparative figures from collections you know, around the world? What types of provisions have been made to um, augment the site, and particularly to bring in content that perhaps might not be at the Seattle Art Museum? Are there uh, they're thinking about that? Uh, definitely. First of all, essays are managed using TMS, mm -hmm. and you could add uh, essays uh, as a media. You could add an essay as a media record. Mm -hmm. That's basically what it is. And if you look at the essay currently, it does have comparative images from other institutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me just yeah. uh, show you that quickly. So, for example, here on Zamming. So we're able to add all of these images as well. And again, um, these are not part of the specific collection. Yeah, the comparable images are actually not from the CLR. Yeah. But we also have a section that is called the related works. Uh -huh. The related works are the works that are in the Seattle Art Museum collection that mm -hmm. we think may be of interest to other people who are just serving our collection. So for instance, mm -hmm. if, there is, if someone were to click on um, a plum painting, and then on the related works, um, then you would see, like this one is a landscape. Um, it's a landscape in the style of you know, some Yuan Dynasty masters. And then all the related works, what I have selected are the works that are also painted in the manner mm -hmm. of uh, you know, those with the same source. Mm -hmm. So the related works are not really stylistically, they look the same, but it's just the, you know, the relationship is quite right, exactly. tenuous. Mm -hmm. so it's, Anyone can make some kind of association, sure. but it's just a way for us to, you know, put our collection out there for people to make the connections. Yeah. And also an ability to comment on the essays. Uh, we thought about it in terms that people could contribute, and eventually it's possible on Sam's side to use these comments within an essay and give attributions to people as well. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to stay the same. These things could change over the time. I want to push on that question a little more about how the external images come in. What's the mechanism for it? Was what you showed basically a deep link into somebody else's website, or can you upload the images? If I'm a scholar and I have a cache of images that are mine, and I'd like to write an essay where I put those in, is that an option? Uh, not currently, no. This is not an option here. All you can do here is annotate existing images or view the images that were um, placed in the essays. So but, ba basi yeah. basically, the mechanism to submit to submit essays would be pretty much manual. And then they would have to be entered mm -hmm. by, by the staff in Seattle Art Museum. And also, that gives us um, uh, some control. Uh, Josh is going to be the administrator of the site. And um, people who log in as a scholar or uh, want to submit an essay, if someone did, for example, um, it, would, it would go through that process first. I'm sure Josh and Mimi would read through and you know, critique. We'd probably have some editing done in-house. And, uh, you know, and then once it's all vetted, if we, I mean, we have the way and the means to add an essay. If we are going to add essay, is a different question. Does that make sense? Yeah. The dual question is about securing comparable <laughs> images. Basically, the way that we uh, uh, 
we treat the comparable images really as a print publication. So we will go to the institutions yeah. to get their permission mm -hmm. as well. And, and actually, that turns out to be a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Trickier yes. than getting permissions for a print publication yes. because so many of these institutions are so worried about yeah. uh, you know, and, and, their right. or images to. And there, and there was one issue that was really raised at the OSCE uh, convenings at the Getty. And Maureen Whalen, who's the um, general counsel for the Getty, went ahead and wrote a template letter that we were able to use to send out. So um, I hope that helps. Does anybody else have a question? Je Jeffrey. I'm curious about where in your, either your collection management system or your content management system, you're storing the I can answer that very clearly. We don't have a digital asset management system, and we don't have a content management system. We have TMS. So TMS works for us as all three. And so, yes, yes, yes there's a source. source, yeah. And we can add keywords. Yes, yes, yes. We use attributes for that, so we could mm -hmm. attach as many subjects as we would like. Mm -hmm. And where are you storing the master images? Because TMS compresses images when you... Uh, We're storing both the, the thumbnail images for the Explore view and the, the tiled zoomed images on the eMuseum server. Mm -hmm. Yes. This, ahead, th this is a completely separate database. It's actually a completely separate version of eMuseum. Yeah. The, the main website is eMuseum 3.6, I believe. Yes, and it this is, is eMuseum 4. Yeah. Completely separate. So, and, and we will keep two separate versions of eMuseum running. Because of, the fun, you know, because of the customizations and the steroids that this has taken, we don't want it to get infiltrated to our other database. Only kidding. Anybody else have a question? Yes. I have a question about the thumbnail scholarly commenting and sort of the, you know, the participation of scholars. Obviously, the scholarly community around shiny painting is not limited to the English scholarly community. Correct. And I was wondering, do you have, um, how are you planning to handle, you know, commentary, for example, in other languages? Does it support Chinese character sets, or is it pretty much just limited right now to English language scholarly commentary? Theoretically, the it should all be Unicode, so you can comment in other languages. We don't have a language switcher on this site, okay. so uh, it's all in one here. You, but that, it's all in one. That, Josh? That really is a good question. Um, I don't think we have really even thought about the strategy to tackle that question, because we don't know how, but uh, how, e how, how well yeah, the But, but eMuseum will take Unicode, which yeah, means right. it'll take Chinese characters. Yeah, it doesn't. I think, I think the question is how do we have, what, because if someone were to say in Chinese, Oh, I disagree with this argument, but that they may be writing in Chinese. In, and I think her question is how do we you know, deal with those kind of comments? I don't know, because it depends if... Like how you put that discourse? Yeah, kind of I know, I know. Um, so I Josh will respond in Chinese. Hey, we only get two comments written in Chinese. This is something that I do. I can have old friends. I would just yeah. translate. I it. can't. I know that. So. <laughs> <laughs> but we have there were many, many comments, and I think that is what we just have to assume I don't know. It really is a. I think we just have to pass it as well. You, you know, as we go, yeah. you know, things change, paths open up, things we'll find out features that we wish we had made or things that we, you know, are grateful that we've done. And um, I'm just very happy. I'm very proud. I think at this point we see the technology, we know it's working well, the content is coming right along, and I, for one, am, as a cheerleader for this, have, is very happy. So you had a question, and maybe? Yeah, uh, two quick questions. OK, uh, sure. One is the, on the essays, if I'm just wondering if they're indexed or searchable separate from the images. And then the second was when you were expecting a public launch for this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, 
I'm actually not sure if the essay is searchable, but it could easily be made searchable um, through the optical recognition of the media files. Uh, we could read the, the text inside of those files and uh, integrate that into the eMuseum search. It's all, it's all in default eMuseum. It just needs to, like a flip of a switch. The launch date, you want to? I will hold you to it. Thank you. I'm curious myself. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, um, how, how can I put this? Um, we're working on content. Um, the group one, like Josh was talking about, we have, we have a, four groups in this. Um, group one, which are the most in-depth, that is just about complete. Um, the editing process took quite a bit longer than we expected. Uh, the translations and the transcriptions, that in itself was quite a tremendous feat. Um, Mimi Gates worked with Jan Wong to do quite a bit of the poetry translations and the colophones. Um, and she was unbelievable to me because, again, I don't, you know, have a handle on the Chinese language. So I, you know, she would come in and say it. I had to look through a, you know, a, a Buddhist dictionary to find this one character and, and be able to translate it. Because there's apparently, Josh, 60,000 characters? How many characters? A lot more than the, a lot more than the Roman alphabet. So, um, so I would say just from that perspective, um, you want to date. Right now, we're our farthest out date that we're going to put this is um, April 15th of 2014. 2013. 2013. <laughs> this coming April. I just gave Danielle a heart attack. A for the rest of already, or you want to? Yeah. Well, there's some debate going on there, but the desire on Josh and Mimi's part is to wait and have everything at once. But, you know, I'd be curious to see what you all think. I mean, do you. Jeffrey, what are, you, what are you doing at the Freer Sackler? Are you? We've got two more years to work. Uh-huh. Well, would you publish just a portion, or would you wait till everything's complete? You're going to wait, yeah. So, and how about at the National Gallery what are you, with Dutch painting? Oh, sorry. It's still an option. It's still an option. It is an option, yeah. Right. Yeah, correct. How, how about the National Gallery? I know you're working with your Dutch paintings. It was interesting because I, I thought it would be launched by now. Um, and I think the dream was to have the core set of the, the Dutch set of paintings done, all the entries written, all that ready. And now we've acquired new paintings. Right, right, right. right. Huge. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And really, even though I'd like to see it done with the technology done, that layer, I think the implication went on the board. Right. I, I will say this, though, if anyone here is interested or anyone listening to this online, if any of you want to have more information, please feel free to contact um, Michelle Miller at um, the Seattle Art Museum. Um, Josh Yu, I'm going to put a plug in for Josh. Uh, Josh Y at uh, SeattleArtMuseum.org or Michelle M at um, SeattleArtMuseum.org. And we'll be more than happy to answer questions offline or give you more information as we are growing with this because it really is a, it's been a labor of love, but we enjoy it every minute, almost. <laughs> <laughs> um, getting at this question of searchability, and I, I don't know if this was an aspect of your question or not, um, but how will these things be? Um, indexed in terms of um, scholarly publications. If one who wasn't an expert in the field, for example, <coughs> and didn't know about the resource already, how, I mean, if I'm going to OCLC, or how are these going to be indexed as publications? Many mm -hmm. you're planning to contribute to OCLC as almost like their, their books, uh, right. based upon our librarian's one. advice about that. And is, is the content visible to Google? Yes. Yes. I have a question. Maybe it's very overarching, which is in the course of doing all this, 
and this is for both the people from Seattle Art Museum and also the art system. How has this changed your thinking about the rest of your collection, about uh. foreseeing in the future two, three, four, five, six different windows into aspects of the collection, and how you use the system, and how the system might need to change to accommodate those? It's a big question. Yeah, thanks, Jeffrey. Um, I, <laughs> I would say this. Um, I've been working in TMS 2012 now um, because I've been doing a lot of the data entry for this class or group one records. Um, and I would say that the usability of that and some of the features that were created actually were, I, I feel, TMS 2010 kind of came along because of the National Gallery. That's the way I look at it. I'd like to say that TMS 2012 some of the features were specific to help all institutions, but to help us with this. Um, so I, I'm losing my train of thought. So the, <laughs> go ahead, tell me again what you're. How you might, if you're comfortable now, putting the same amount, same kind of content into TMS for other online projects, large or small. Well, I mentioned the, uh, Porcelain Stories is an example. It's a beautiful bound book. Um, we have a lovely porcelain room at Sam, which is one of our prides and joy. I don't know if any of you have been downtown yet, but if you do, please go and, and see the porcelain room. Um, so I think from my perspective, that would be a project that we would maybe start with next, or at least I'd like to see that happen next. We have uh, the photography is finished for that. Um, the content is there. Now, if we go back to the curator and say, gee, Julie, you wrote this book 10 years ago. Are you interested in updating content? I know what the answer is going to be. So, you know, I, I think having the tool, knowing now what we know, because we're on this side of, of the project as opposed to the beginning of it, um, having the tools that we can use in house and with our limited staff, they feel confident that they can take this custom, customize the museum and 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 work with us to to create more online things. So I'm feeling pretty good about it. I mean personally, but I you know who knows. So anybody else? Oh, do you want to say something? Yeah, I, that's a very good question, Jeffrey. Um, I mean, you, there are many other areas in the Chinese collection, for instance, that we could because of this catalog. I continue to um, to build on. But I think, speaking from a curatorial standpoint, I don't necessarily think that the online catalog is the best place to, um, well, not the best, I, I, I need to really phrase this carefully. But <laughs> I, have been asked, I have been asked so many times that I do it again, if I, if I, if I had the chance. Um, because so much work actually is required to go into uh, looking. I, I was really completely ignorant about all these kind of web architecture. And, to me, the major difference between a public, uh, print publication and an online uh, catalog is that you have to orient the um, viewer as to the kind of information that the information that you want them to have. Whereas that kind of orientation was not was not necessary in a book because it's just a flat narrative. Like in the catalog, where do we want the inscriptions to appear? Someone raised the questions: Are we not placing as much emphasis on the essay? Um, I wasn't too concerned about that because I, I feel that as long as the information is there, then people would know enough to click it. And then it's just, but then the placement of this information is interesting to me. I think if I were to have an opportunity to work on an online catalog again, I would emphasize so I would not emphasize so much on a scholarly essay, for instance. I, I wouldn't use the online format as the principal platform for publishing a scholarly essay. That's what I, I, I think that I would take advantage of this kind of um, catalog to make the collection available and then with the most updated uh, tombstone information and then just like get that kind of information out for people to see. And then I would still write my own paper uh, articles and try to get them published elsewhere in a journal or article. Because really spending time on trying to negotiate with museums on um, getting the images out, out on the online channel, it really is not one. It's not worth the time. <laughs> I mean, I've, this is a very interesting question for rights and reproductions for the comparable images. Some institutions, they, it's, it's purely personal connections. You know 
the curator at the Shanghai Museum, they give you free images at no cost over email. And then it's not even a contract. And then you just have the email and say, I think this is worth doing. And then you keep it in your record. And then we have the image, we do it. And we did submit that proper official letter drafted by the Getty. And then we, at first, we actually submitted that formal application to some of these museums. And they said no. And I said, wait, what's going on? And then I asked my friend, oh, no, no, we, I'll take care of it. And then your dad got taken care of. And so when it comes to the, if we were to look at the rights as a, as a price, like, it really ranged from zero to $150 per image for a nine image hand scroll. So we are talking about we could potentially have paid $1,000 for the rights to publish just one hand scroll painting from another museum. And then it was just, it was really just really complicated. But our in-house attorney uh, also talked with Josh and explained that if we keep the uh, comparable images to thumbnail size and keep them to 400 by 400, I think it's was 250 by 300, by 300 that um, you know we're and and also make them so that you can't copy and paste them and use them to sell. That we feel pretty confident that we're you know crossing our T's and dotting our I's. So, so anybody else have a question? Yeah. Now that you've done this, you've done all this imaging, you've done all the work, all the images available, and you're talking about dollar points and all that. What do you think about letting people just have your images and not have to worry about all the digital so that if someone wants to write about the hand scroll, they can just download the image? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a big institutional question. And, and we, we have a new director um, who's been here since November 5th. So I'm sure that. You know, this today's only the ninth. She's this is her first week, so I think we'll probably, right? Well, you know, we don't want to push it, but you know, we'll probably talk about it next week. But um, you know, one of the thing, the beauties of uh, uh, the gallery systems is that we can watermark our images. You know, we can put a blind stamp and and so forth. And and I think that that is definitely a, a question for all museums. And I know the. You know, many museums are putting everything out there and just have at it. So we'll we'll see what you know. We'll see what our new administration decides. So. Right. Yeah. 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 We don't really consider. So, in a sense, whenever we get requests to use uh, publish our collection, we, we always actually write it. Yeah. It's okay. It's, it, I just want to say it's five o'clock now, so I think we're going to wrap this up. But go ahead and Wait, ask so your question. I'm just going to quickly mention that actually the College Art Association right now is working on the development of fair use guidelines, and this is one of the, the major issues we're concerned about is the degree to which. Um, the constraints that are being placed on reproductions are actually impeding the scholarship. And so we're hopefully, um, we, we hope within a period of about four years or so, going to be able to, to publish something that will be useful and provide some guidance in this arena. But yeah, I think the M Museum Directors Association has also published, yeah. And, uh, and those are the guidelines the that we follow, guidelines. yeah, the thumbnail guidelines, right? Yeah. We, we are, uh, we're in touch with AAMD. Great. Okay, well, I want you know, to, uh, thanks oh, a lot. Yeah. I have to say it's a little warm in here for me, and I'm from Seattle. Yeah, thank I want, you all. For yeah, I want to thank everyone. Danielle. Yeah.